It's Halloween. Uh, don't ever touch my brother. You hear me, Brett? F you, Diaz. He got his fake blood shit all over my shirt. Look! I told you, it was an accident! Well, this is probably going to be a contentious video. I want to make this perfectly clear before we start the video. I don't like politics. Now, that doesn't mean I don't think politics are important. I don't think that people shouldn't be talking about them, or that games can't talk about them. The thing about art is that it can carry a message in it, whether it be moral, social, or political. And frankly, that's great. It gives more meaning. Art is a perfectly fine vessel to convey an artist's feelings, and can be more powerful as a piece when it has something to it. So... What's the game we're talking about? <laughs> Gonna be honest, once True Colors comes out and I'm done with that video, I'll be glad that I'm moving away from this series. The son of a bitch! Life is Strange 2 is a weird beast, mainly because according to 72% out of 12,000 people, they didn't even know the game existed! I'm not saying that my audience is representative of this. It's just a funny little poll I took just to get some opinions on the game, and as far as I can tell, there's actually a divide between the fan base about it. That could just be from what I saw. And as usual, you got those people who make me not want to even touch the game because I know that they won't actually listen to what I have to say because they act like they're in a cult. Seriously, phantoms can be scary! And pretty egotistical. Honestly, part of me doesn't even want to deal with this game simply because I know it's gonna be a fucking headache. But I find it amazing the game didn't really have that great a reception. Some in part due to the change in the main characters and some poor marketing. I know there was a movement talking about how art can be objective. I'm sure if I talked about the issues that I have with said mindset, I'll probably show up on an EFAP podcast that'll probably be two hours in before they actually get to this segment of the video. But if you don't care, there's a reason why there's things called chapters. You can skip to the next part. Simply put, games, movies, anime, whatever. They are art, and art is subjective. Being an art form, which is perceived differently by different people, is precisely why I don't believe media can be appraised objectively. The things that people rate games and movies on, acting, directing, writing, cinematography, editing, lighting, score, the kitchen sink, and so on, are rated subjectively. What one person thinks is good, another thinks is bad. Are there objective things you can criticize media for? Oh, hella yes! Uh, Daniel, I know you just developed superpowers, but- HOLY SHIT! GOKU, DID YOU TEACH DANIEL INSTANT TRANSMISSION?! Stuff like glitches, technical issues, and that sort of jazz is stuff that can be seen as objective flaws. However, stuff like acting, art direction, graphics, that's subjective! Just because there's an appearance of consensus, that doesn't make something into a fact. Persona 5 was seen as a masterpiece when it came out, but nowadays you've got a ton of people who hate on the game and criticize it. Granted, some of that criticism is complete BS that people seem to guzzle down like it was a fucking Kool-Aid at the nearby church with people's walkie-talkies stuck in their hands. What the frig is this?! Critically acclaimed game, everyone! 10 out of 10! My ass! Jokes and pointing out our awkward award system for games being completely broken, I think it's time we talk about Life is Strange 2, before I have to deal with the headache that the comments section will be. I'm on a common, and let's begin. So. Life is Strange follows the story of Max and Chloe, with Max having time travel powers. Meanwhile, before the storms approach... I am the storm that is God, how I wish I could be playing Devil May Cry 5 right now. Before the storms approach was to follow Chloe as she starts her relationship with Rachel. And if you guys know anything about this channel, I don't think I really need to tell you that those games really aren't worth the amount of awards that were given to them. Then again, considering that the video game awards are nothing more than glorified wankfests by game journalists who barely know how to play a game, I don't really think these awards mean anything anymore. It's the perfect game! No way to deny that! Now, Life is Strange 2, Electric Boogaloo, follows the brothers Sean and Daniel Diaz, two half-Mexican boys with Sean being a teenager and Daniel being a little kid. After the two lose their father in an accident involving a police officer and Daniel developing telekinesis, which, well... <laughs> 
Yeah, the boy in blue ain't getting up. Anyway, the two brothers are on the lam on the way to Mexico, and before we get into the specifics of the actual story, I want to touch on the basic premise, and funnily enough, I find it to be weaker than the original Life is Strange is. The first major difference is that when you played Max, you had the ability to rewind time. It was a power that worked well with the adventure genre that allowed you to redo some decisions you made and even came into play with some elements of the plot and puzzles. Meanwhile, telekinesis, not so much. It's not even the power of the main character who has it. Like, I got issues with the first game story, but at least the time travel mechanic was somewhat interesting. So what does 2 do? Obviously, I'm being a bit hyperbolic for the sake of comedy, but not by much. That's the thing with these adventure games. They have a limitation on forms of gameplay, or at least that's what they have evolved into nowadays. You see, boys and girls, I come from the time of Monkey Island, where these kinds of games would have a different kind of engagement to them. Where the majesty of point-and-click adventure games would have you talk to various people, grab various things, and solve puzzles based upon your inventory and be able to communicate with people. While it was on the rails, it at least provides an entertaining show that distracts the player from the path they're supposed to take. This is kind of a complicated aspect for me to explain, but I guess the best way to read to put it would be... I can see the puppet strings that the developers have for this game. And when you have the story on rails, with the choices being up front, and yet still being led along where the developers want you to go, it can be very distracting. At least with Max, the time traveling powers at least made it so she could be a bit more memorable, and you could take back your choices. But, there was a drastic shift. The shift from take your choices at any moment to your choices gradually evolve and change Daniel's personality is neat, but mechanically unfulfilling. It doesn't really feel like they utilize that shift all that well, at least to me. Especially when there's nothing else to the game. Most of what Sean can do is extremely dull. Pick up stuff. Look at stuff. Draw some stuff. Talk to someone's stuff. There are no real puzzles to solve, no challenge, no real difficulty to figure out what to do next. Gee, thanks, Don't Nod. You really made me understand why I love video games, just as exciting as folding my laundry. Another aspect that doesn't help is the basic story structure change. In the original game, it was a quasi-murder mystery high school drama with a supernatural bullshit twist. And frankly, I prefer there to be some mystery in a game. Here, the murder isn't a mystery, and we're just watching the Diaz brothers' lives get progressively worse. So it doesn't feel like the plot is progressing, except for when Sean says, We must shift down in Mexico! Seriously though, I think Sean is a furry. Just look at his notebook. He's totally a furry. What is this? What is all this shit? He's a furry. Is that Cool Cat? Cool Cat on weed? Total furry. What is this? What is this? Oh my god! Back on topic, obviously there's gonna be a preference for these types of stories. A mystery is more than likely to get a few more people invested as it entices the audience with a question that they can draw people into. Life is Strange 2 does have sort of a mystery, but in comparison to Rachel's disappearance in this one, it doesn't really act as a driving force for the two brothers in their escapades. Heck, if anything, I'd say the story of Life is Strange 2 lacks a lot of impact that the first one did. And for me to say that after criticizing both the first and sequel, that's gotta mean something. We also need to take into account location. In the first game, Arcadia Bay was a singular location where the story took place, and that had its strengths. It allows you to have a more coherent cast of characters, familiar locations, allows you to get away with asset reuse and location modifications, etc, etc. However, with 2's story, the whole game focuses on traveling through a number of different locations and seasons. Not only does this make the story a bit more jumbled, since you have to have a different set piece each chapter that can't really be used in other chapters, but the way the story is set up, you won't really have much of a chance to form a connection to the side characters. Or at least one that's not really meaningful. I'm not saying that a story like this can't work, but it requires a lot of work and effort to make the side characters memorable, as well as having a protagonist who can work with the limited time they have with the other characters. <coughs> now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's actually dive into the story and the issues I have with it. I think before we continue, we do need to consider the inciting incident. Now, while I do have my own thoughts on this, I thought it'd be best to get the perspective of someone who has experience with this. So I'd like you to meet my editor, Mr. Cake Dragon Man. Hello, good morning, guten tag, uh, good evening. 
Uh, and all that other garbage. It's me, Mr. Cake Dragon Man. Now, for those of you who don't know, I have been editing the Life is Strange videos since day one, and if I look at Chloe Price's stupid, dumb face again, I will actually end my existence. Now, I was tasked to watch the initial video right here, and the reason why is because my family has a bad history with cops. We do no shitty cops when we see one. We live in fucking Florida, so you already know that shit's fucked. Now, I'm gonna watch the initial scene and I'm gonna give my commentary on certain things that are just wrong so as Philip DeFranco says let's just jump right into it now the first initial thing that I have to say here is I hate Sean and his dumb face and his dumb furry comics and all this other garbage that he does he always makes things worse I don't think I've seen a single scene where Sean has actively made things better yes I understand that he is 16 years old but even a 16 year old isn't a complete dumbass this man literally has the IQ equivalent of Luz Noceta from the Owl House and trust me that's not a good thing while watching the scene prior we do get to see that the, the kid uh, the racist kid with the fake blood on his shirt is definitely a piece of shit but the problem that I have is that his insult are just lame. Oh yeah, go hide in your dad's garage. He's a fucking retard. Take the little baby back to his crib. Yeah, go back to daddy. Pussies. He literally does the fucking ooh woo voice and shit. I swear, when? Also, if the entire family are a bunch of racist assholes, why do you live next to them? Granted, we don't know the situation between the family of uh, the racist kid or the, uh, I don't know the fuck what Sean and Daniel's last names are. Still, there should be some sort of like middle ground you should meet. I mean, there's no way that this is Daniel's first offense of being a complete dumbass. The IQ stem does not fall far from the tree of this family because I'm gonna explain why everyone in this family are a bunch of dumbass idiots. <laughs> With Sean, you can choose to do the right thing for him to be mad at Daniel for spraying that stuff on the other guy and then you could walk away. I think the problem that I have though is the fact that like the kid just keeps fucking going and him talking about his mom like essentially sets him off and then after that we get this 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 neat punch in the fucking face. Okay. Oh. Whoa! Sean, you hit him! I like the fact that the racist kid literally got no shots in to just to prove how pathetic they are. Listen, I understand that you want to write racists in a bad light, but at least get a few shots from the other kid, you know? I, I don't expect wimpy artist bitch boy Sean to take on a guy who, I'm gonna just guess and say that he's like some sort of like athlete of some kind. Let's just say he isn't, and he's a normal kid. Then the cop comes in when uh, Daniel pushes the kid to the ground and apparently he just fucking expires which no listen i have seen matt hardy fall down and i understand that kid's a babby he's a little boy but i'm also gonna have to say bullshit because he landed on the grass if there was like a rock that his head laid onto then it would have been possible for him to fucking die if anything the, his back hit a fucking rock but it was a very thin rock a very shitty looking fake ass rock uh so that might hurt his back the the biggest fuck you to me is the cop he's just absolutely terrified of these children for no reason and is inexperienced there should be two cops by the way from what i have seen you are not allowed to go solo during rides you're supposed to have backup with you at all times and for some reason this fucking goober over here is by himself obviously a rookie obviously scared of the situation at hand so we don't know why he's fucking there and then the big scene with the dad. No, 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 I'm sorry. Sean fucking instigates him more. Step away. Now. <sighs> Calm down, <laughs> officer. You dense motherfucker. If you are dealing with a bad cop or racist cop or any of those cops, you have to listen to what they say or you will be in trouble. Unless they are actually provoking your rights and being fucking bastards to you, then you have to listen to them or you are going to get fucking hurt. <laughs> But the problem with this cop is he has a gun. 
He doesn't take out a taser. He takes out a fucking gun on two children. What the fuck? The fucking dad runs in and tries to stop the cop. We didn't do Sean, anything. Sean, be quiet. I swear. Officer, oh, Sean, God. listen. Oh, I'm sorry, Dad. Daddy, be quiet. I want to go home. They're good kids, officer. Don't and then, you know, he gets shot and fucking dies. And, and, then, and then Daniel does his stupid powers and shit. And yeah, this is the portion where I give my final thoughts. Uh, not all police are bad. In reality, they go in pairs. So, uh, this makes no sense in reality whatsoever. Uh, thank you, Manga Common, for the money. I will now spend it on uh, a REM body pillow. Now get the f fuck out of my trash hole! I appreciate my editor's take on this. Now, granted, there are some issues that I do have with this opening. I'm not blind to the anti-cop rhetoric that our country has, and I'm certainly not going to deny that there are terrible cops in the United States. But I'm really hard-pressed to see how this particular cop is racist. Everything given in the game that we can view about this cop says that this guy was only six months on the job and apparently did charity work outside of it. Nothing the cop said was racist. It's not like he went, DROP THE BURRITO! The only aspect that can be gleaned from the game's information is that the cop was interacting with the main characters and their father. Now, if there's information I'm missing, please let me know. Anyway, once we get the copy of Life is Strange is opening... Oh. Sean takes a knocked out Daniel and runs off. This is probably the part of the video where you guys think I'm gonna chide the kid for running away from the scene. Well, fuck you, you don't know me. Sorry to be disappointing, but considering that this is a 16 year old kid who just witnessed his father dying right before his eyes, I'm more than willing to be a bit more understanding. At least at this point in the story. No, 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 no. My issue is the believability. Here's the thing when you set a story with a supernatural element in our real world. Unless there's been a presence that's been known publicly, the assumption of the real world and the setting that the story takes place in will be ours as well. That includes events, laws, and the culture at the time. More specifically, laws. We're shown that there's documented footage of the cop being killed by being flung over by a powerful force. Enough force to flip him onto the car and even push the car over. So how the bloody hell would a teenager be able to pull that off? But this isn't anime or a video game. How in the world would the cops be able to determine if Sean was even responsible for this sort of thing? What? Do the cops have their own psyche that tells them these things? I see nothing here. You see, that's the problem here. When you put a story based in our world, you're going to have to play by the logic of our world. In addition, I have no idea how the cops were unable to find the two brothers in the first chapter, especially since Sean still had his cell phone on him. Because, guess what? Regardless if the phone is turned off or not, your phone can connect to the internet. If your phone can connect to the internet, the police can track you, and they can do it legally too. So for all intents and purposes, this should have happened. Fuck it, go down to Mexico, you know? Denied! Casey Smith! You're on. Uh, do I still get paid? Look. I admit I'm getting a bit too pedantic about this, but when a game wants to give a message about this sort of thing, you need to expect questions, and if at the drop of a hat your questions begin to put holes in the narrative, especially the basic setup, it makes it hard for me to want to actually believe this story. Then again, the characters make that a chore as well. Dead animal! Uh-oh, we're gonna start another Kiro the Wolf situation. <laughs> Screw this! Ah, oh, don't do that! I think it's important to realize that with this story, it has a completely different structure from the original game. I mentioned it before, but since Life is Strange 2 has the Diaz brothers crossing the country, as such, it means that the characters you meet will have much more limited screen time and you'll have to limit development for them as well. The characters were the strongest part of the first two games, at least, uh, if you like them. But here, while the Diaz brothers remain the focus of the story, there's a single additional character in the entire story that remains a focus for more than a full episode. And while that character is important to the story, it seems that Life is Strange 2 generates characters only to toss them away at the first chance they get when we get to the next chapter. Sure, you might get a check-in on the character, but they soon disappear. Like, take for example... I know what you're thinking. No, it can't be. Glasses, reddish hair, hipster. He likes to make literature references in his writing. No, it's, it's, no! You know, I always wonder what would happen to Alex if he was able to survive Yik. It's only appropriate that he'd be writing a progressive blog talking about nudists in a gas station in front of a little kid 
Sicko. What the hell is this creep looking at? Anyway, Brody here only shows up for the first episode, helps out the characters in a big way, and save for a couple of small blurbs that you read about on his blog, that's the only thing you get for this character. So if the audience liked this character, THIS PLACE IS THE BOMB! <laughs> <laughs> That's the only time you get to actually interact with him. There's barely any character development for the side characters. NPCs like Life is Strange 1 had Victoria and David change over the course of the story. That was but part of the magic of the first game for what I got. You really got to see the multifaceted characters at almost every turn. They start off as one no characters, but as you progress through the story, they slowly evolved. At least some of them did. In this game, we're stuck with the faceless NPCs that come and go, but matter little. Most are so paper thin, they don't bother to just border on being stereotypes. They are stereotypes, and they're not around long enough to matter anyway. I'm not saying there aren't good moments with these characters. Don't handle this alone. Maybe you're right. His grandparents, my wife's parents, they offered me their help, and... They want Chris to go live with them. But they are in the minority. Let's talk about Sean and Daniel's mother. Karen. Yes, that's her name. She practically is one of the few characters that is built up and actually has some follow through. Like through the first chapter, we get a hint that Karen disappeared since the Diaz family only had their father looking out for them. And in the second chapter, we visit the grandparents' home and learn more about her. Then in episode four... Hey, yeah. Right, let's talk about Karen's reason for leaving. I didn't have a choice, Sean. We only have one life, and I didn't want mine to be spent in regrets. For years, I fooled myself, thinking I'd find satisfaction into what society expected me to be, and that was my mistake. I hope someday you can understand that. Why does this sound so fam- While the rest of us were pursuing college, careers, families. Sarah wasn't looking for any of that. She was looking for escape. However much she loved you then, it wasn't enough. For Sarah, the need to escape was always there. Way to go, recycling character beats. Woo! And I'm sure this is a common event amongst plenty of parents who are saddled with kids. It's something that I can understand. But the game does a terrible job of making me want to empathize with the character and how it frames her. Karen's choice of living free without regrets meant that she'd leave her husband to take care of an eight-year-old kid and a newborn alone. And here's the thing, I completely understand the feeling of being trapped by society's standards as well as not wanting to waste the only life I have. Ironic considering I'm wasting a lot of my life making these videos, but you get the point. But here's the rub, it shouldn't be at the expense of others, especially when those others are lives that you yourself created. When you have kids, your life isn't yours anymore. You can still pursue dreams and passions to a point, but your kids should come first. You made a human being that needs care, love, and attention. The way the story frames Karen, I kind of expected there to be a better reason than I was looking for an escape. Something that the series already tackled in Before the Storm. I wouldn't have much of an issue with this, but apparently she cut all forms of communication off with her family save for a P.O. box. With how it was set up, I was expecting there to be a bit more oomph to the reason why she left. The game did make a big deal of preventing Sean and Daniel from going to her room. Really, the only characters at Life is Strange 2 that feel like they get a proper amount of development is the group that the brothers meet in Episode 3. This is a collective that the main characters join and spend time with, and that's where Life is Strange 2 is probably the strongest when it takes the time to explore and make the characters feel like other characters that are important to the story. At least in theory, it's filled with a lot of fluff. But sure enough, by the end of the episode, all the development that these characters are having is quickly shoved aside to move to the story elements, and the players are left feeling lost again, at least in my experience. It's not being lost because of a lack of direction, but an inability to hold on to anything in value. It comes off if it's too eager to explore its themes, and it ignores what the player wants to have something more than a fleeting experience. In my experience, players will constantly be trying to make lasting relationships with characters that they like, even choosing options in the hope that those characters might reappear. Yet, in this game, it constantly acts like it doesn't want to invest any additional time into the characters. It has a much more important story it wants to rush into, as it wants to really tell a story about racism. Hell, this even actually hurts the main characters, Sean and Daniel, because, well, 
I don't really care for them. They're really the only consistent characters, but the relationships and interactions with each other are conflicting, to say the least. Not help that Sean is probably one of the blandest main characters in gaming I've ever played in a while. And it has to do with the formatting that a lot of the episodes follow. Daniel does something stupid, Sean knows it's stupid and warns Daniel, but Daniel doesn't listen, things backfire on Daniel, Sean tries to save him again, Daniel starts to overreact, and then uses his powers to make some heavy life-death decision. Yay! And then the two brothers go back on the road. It kind of gets redundant when you realize that's practically how every episode goes, and how sometimes the changes come out of left field. Like, in episode 4 when Daniel joins a religious cult after thinking his brother was practically dead, and instead of listening to his brother, listens to the crazy cult lady. Even though Danielle was never really religious. Let's go away from this and focus on Sean's choices. Now, I'll give a little credit. Your choices in the story are used to actually change up the story at the end. While there is a binary choice at the end of the game, there are multiple endings that depending on how you choose to do good things or bad things, Daniel will react to your choice and change the result. Again, I have to tip my hat to this, as it fixes one of the biggest issues that it was in the first game for me. The only other problem, though, was that the rest of your choices don't make a lick of sense or don't matter. There's a path that the writers want you to take, and no matter what you say, no matter what you do, you will follow that path. Granted, this is a criticism I have with a lot of adventure games, and only a handful of examples of visual novels work with it. I may have issues with the game, but a more recent example of this is Detroit Become Human, where it has a lot of different paths, and even your choices can affect other aspects of your characters. Meanwhile, in Life is Strange 2, there are some changes between the behaviors of Daniel and Sean, but depending on the chapter, there will be dominant character traits that fly in the face of your choices. Such as in Chapter 3, Sean, no matter what you do, will be caught stealing from a drug dealer. It makes your choices hollow when your characters bring up the same outcome. Should I go back to Seattle? Maybe I can try and explain everything. What happened? You should do what you think is best. If going to Mexico seems like the right thing to do, then so be it. So even if you want to go back, the game says no. You gotta trust me this one time. No, I don't. Not after what you did. But yes, we have to be a team to rescue Daniel. No, but yes. Uh... Got this, Sean. Daniel can open that safe with his eyes closed. On. No, Meryl's probably wasted, like every night. You guys can get to Puerto Lobos in style, with a, a nest egg. <laughs> but you don't want Daniel to be homeless anymore, right? Huh? Then let's do this. I wouldn't let you in on this if I had any doubt. I can't, Finn. No way. Too dangerous for Daniel. <laughs> nah. See, Daniel is the dangerous one. Nobody can even touch him. Twelve seconds later. Finn is out of control. Has he done this before? Fuck us over? Not like this. Why now? Because Finn thinks Daniel is his golden ticket. Shit. You scared the shit out of me. Good. What the fuck are you doing? Didn't we settle this, man? Shh. You're gonna wake Meryl. Finn, no fucking way. Come on, Sean. Are you kidding me? How could you do that, Finn? And you're so fucking kid. Thanks for respecting my choices, game. The illusion of choice rears its ugly head, Come. and you can see the strings from the Puppet Master. And there are other aspects that your choice doesn't matter. Take episode 2 for a prime example. In episode 1, you have a choice to throw your phone away so the cops can't trace you, even though that makes no sense. You can then choose to not call Sean's friend, Lila. The goal is to stay hidden and not arouse suspicion from the police, right? Well, guess what? No matter what you do, you'll be forced to go into town, and then you're forced to get Daniel a present. And if you don't have enough money, well, you'll be forced to steal. Better find a gift for Daniel quick. While he's still busy with Chris. This is so different. I don't...
I... I know it sucks, but... Daniel deserves it too. Right? Even if you don't use the phone or the internet, the police still come because someone stall you at the market and you're forced to run away. Thanks, game! One more example and we'll move on. In that same chapter, Daniel will want to check out Karen's room and, well... I want to go check on the room. Upstairs. I know it's Mom's. Please. Daniel, you heard Claire. They will freak out if they know we went inside. We won't tell them. We'll be in total stealth mode. 12 seconds later. Sean, this is super easy. I can just break the lock with my power. Stealth mode, huh, Daniel? As you can see, even if you don't want to, you still gotta do this. And this just makes me dislike the characters in the game's choices as a whole. What's even the point of the choices if they don't actually affect the path? It's like Final Fantasy Hallway all over again. Play the game. I thought I was playing the game, John. But I've been using the wrong controller the whole time. Here's the thing. The characters, including Sean, are out of my control. Don't Not is completely focused on how Daniel sees you. And while there are some effects to that agree, it's at the cost of changing the story. I was forced to do stupid things in episode 1. I was forced to do stupid things in episode 2. The smoke has disappeared and the mirrors are shattered. The illusion of choice has been broken. Which is the worst thing you can do for a game that says that your choices do matter. And we go back to Sean and Daniel as characters, and how the redundancy actively hurts them as such. Not help that I don't find him to be compelling characters. Sean especially since I find him to be extremely bland and boring. Sean is the typical teenager who's not too confident in himself and who suddenly has to grow up in order to take care of his little brother. He isn't really charming. He isn't really all that interesting. He's average. And while that's great for realism, that in and of itself is a problem. Average people are boring as all hell. Clearly, for all the issues I had with her, I could easily say she didn't bore me. She pissed me off and made me question the blood alcohol level of all those working for Don't Nod, but at the very least, she had my attention. Sean? Well, there's not much to say about the guy. He likes to draw, he's a furry, but there's not much to make for me really care for him. Sure, bad things happen to the kid, but just because there are bad things happening to him, that doesn't make for a compelling character. It's like the writers don't know any way of conveying emotion and therefore just threw up their hands at every turn and wrote in a violent act. After getting punched in the face or stomach for the third or fifth time, it tends to lose its effect. For crying out loud, it even happens in the church, multiple times! Violence being substituted for emotion and this is the hallmark of bad writing. Let me just put it like this, violence being used in place of actual emotion is kind of a telltale sign of bad writing. It's kind of what you get when you see Michael Bay pull this. If I had to say anything that was even remotely good about the characters in this regard, it's their relationship with Daniel. But as I said, there are plenty of times where Daniel just did outright stupid things that didn't make me care for the kid. Daniel is still a little kid, naive and childish. He wants his way and often gets in trouble with Sean. To make things even more painful, Daniel is painted as an obnoxious brat. He's supposed to be 9 years old, but the writers seem to give him the brains of someone with half that age at best. So you have to babysit this crybaby the whole time who can't exercise any form of judgment. Makes you wonder what kind of education he got for the last 8 years. Pro tip to writers. Please, don't write children as utterly stupid. They are typically smarter than you think. Hell, I've seen a lot of smart kid characters who can be very compelling and not be annoying. There's also the fact that the voice acting isn't all that great either. All in all, I don't really like the characters. They're mostly just boring to me. Well, we've gotten to the point of the video that I'm dreading. The political commentary. Then go back to your own country. <laughs> I'm gonna point this out from the get-go. Yes, I am well aware that people like this do exist. I'm not trying to deny that. But the problem is that it's so one note and black and white, it practically beats you over the head. And it lacks any sort of subtlety or nuance. The messages that the game is trying to give are so obvious that I want to know that being racist is bad. I could have spent two minutes on Twitter and saved myself time, money, and the headaches that this game's fan base is going to give me after this video goes up to learn that lesson. Racism is bad. Well, Thanks for that one, don't nod. You're the reason we need to build it. Yes! <laughs> ah, there is no such thing as subtlety in this game. 
Life is Strange 2 has the desire to talk about racism, but Life is Strange 2 can make a compelling or interesting antagonist for even a short vignette. Don't Nod doesn't spend any time exploring racism or racist people. Characters just hate Sean and Daniel because those characters are racist, and that's the entire arc of the villains in each of these pieces. They are single note and uninteresting, not because of their racism, but rather the lack of anything else about them. And in turn, the only thing that Life is Strange 2 can do is repeat the same message. Racism is a problem, but it's more powerful when someone can realize that anyone could be racist, or that racists may be able to hide their racism. Instead, the multiple Multiple times that Life is Strange 2 confronts racism, they choose the most in-your-face examples with it with one-dimensional characters that only exist to be racist, so they could play out their moral stories and show characters what it's like. You speak Spanish, Pedro? Huh? And why does this scene even exist? Nothing you do here matters in the rest of the game. It literally just exists to make Sean more miserable and throw in more racist white people, which the game already established multiple times beforehand. This game has nothing more to contribute to the racial commentary then everything is toxic, harmful, illegal, dangerous, irresponsible, and morally wrong. And what hurts the message more is what ethically deplorable the main characters do to other people. It's justified and wed away because they had mean things said to them by demonized caricatures of white people who have no death written to them to their characters beyond they're white and they're racist. I guess at this point, I want to turn to my editor again for his input. Okay, I got all of my stuff insured, everything's set. So you will go on a date with me for $50,000 in public for five minutes. Okay, Nami from One Piece, that sounds like a deal. Now let me just say the funny number is... <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't want volcano insurance. Uh, hey guys, <laughs> you were just catching me at a really bad time. <laughs> uh, what, what, what did you want me to do? Oh, right, right, the racism garbage. Okay, so, listen. Here, I'll just say that from my experiences, I was lucky enough to be in schools that had other Hispanics. Well, out of all of the Hispanics in the world, Peruvians are the least represented in all of American media. All we have is fucking Benjamin Brad and that voice actor guy, and, uh, yeah, no, that's it. I was quite fortunate to be in a school that had just a lot of Hispanics like myself. I mean, don't get me wrong, I was still bullied. <laughs> Relentlessly, actually, for a bunch of other stupid reasons. My weight, my social ineptitude, my autism, my gullible nature, you know, all that other stuff that completely and utterly traumatized me and fucked me up to the adult that I am today, now living in a goddamn cardboard box. Only for me to look up into the stars and just ask God, why? Why did you do this to me? WHAT SICK GAME ARE YOU PLAYING AT?! Why is Sean hot wiring a car with his bare hands? I mean, I've seen it done before, but Sean? Really? The little bitch baby furry kid who fucking draws and shit? He, he can get his ass kicked throughout the entire game and almost never throw a punch, but he'll hot wire a car. Fucking brilliant. Yeah, that's uh, all I gotta say. Life is strange, bad. Watch some stuff, good. Please, for the love of God, go subscribe to watch some stuff. What I find more baffling is that according to Don't Nod, they did field work. The writing team also traveled across the west coast of the United States to conduct field research, and also visited Mexico to conduct research on the background of the heritage of the two main characters of Life is Strange 2. Which, if you ask me, I have to applaud, as it allows developers to get a good grasp of the culture and lands they wish to depict in their games. It kind of reminds me of Sonic Adventure. And in that game, the developers actually went to the various locations to get inspiration for their game. It's that dedication that I really like and can appreciate that developers want to get a good grasp on realism for their games. But here's the thing, realism does not equate to good writing, and when you have a scene like the one in episode 4 that doesn't really add anything to the game or story, it hurts the overall message. The message is blunt, and it beats you over the head without talking about anything really deep about it. Hey, Sean? Why would they build this? Well... I just find it to be overtly on the nose and extremely one note. 
And it's not just with the racism. Cops are evil bastards and shoot before asking questions. About half the white people you meet are evil racists. Religious folks are evil fanatics. And hippies are all good guys who just happen to love drugs. Even if you choose to steal from the drug dealer in Chapter 3, it's framed as a good thing. Did they really have to paint such a binary world in which everyone is either supremely good or incredibly evil without any sense of subtlety? But I think I know why. This is just my own theory, but... Don't Nod could be avoiding the possibility of having the audience be overly sympathized with bigots, as it mainly comes off as a heavy-handed shortcut that conveniently uses realism as a guise to avoid having more complex characters. And once again, we have redundancy popping in. These racist people do the same thing every time. They say something racist, then unsubtly allude to the former Cheeto president's rhetoric before violently acting out and beating Sean, which happens a ridiculous amount of times. It reinforces how dull the writing is and how Don't Nod lacks the care to properly tackle a tough subject. Subject. Also, side note, since I couldn't really put this anywhere else, I love how every other character is stupid too. Like in Chapter 4, before you break out of the hospital, <laughs> you find that there's a message for Sean in his sketchbook that tells him where the twitchy hippie guy took Daniel to. Apparently his name was Hackerman. <laughs> I like that. Hackerman. But the FBI never thought to look through Sean's possessions? Ugh. Anyway, I think you guys get it. I don't think Life is Strange 2 does a good job at a lot of things. So here comes the part of the video that I've been looking forward to! At this point I think you guys know the drill. At this point I talk about a game slash character that I think it does a good job of what I've been complaining about. It should come to no surprise that the game, or in this case games, that I'm talking about are the great Ace Attorney. Objection. Obviously, narratively, character-wise, and presentation-wise, I find these two games to be a much better than Life is Strange 2. Hell, I honestly believe that these two games tackle the subject of racism in a much more nuanced manner, too. To give a bit more synopsis, you play as Ryunosuke Naruhoto, an ancestor of Phoenix Wright, who gets thrusted into the world of law after an incident that I don't want to spoil at the moment, and travels to London in order to fulfill a dream. As Ryunosuke, you'll come across several colorful characters and twists and turns in the dark underbelly of the 19th century London, trying to find the truth and defend his clients from false accusations. I'm gonna say it outright, I think this is a much better game series than Life is Strange, especially too. So let's start by tackling the characters. With the exception of the first two cases in the first game, the Great Ace Attorney for the most part has its story stay in the same place. It's not a road trip story. But to point something out, with the exception of the main cast of four, the cast for each trial tend to have some very unique characters that you most likely won't actually see again. And this is due to the personality and design of the characters. Even though you don't specifically remember the characters' names, you'll more than likely remember the characters' appearances in your head because while grounded, they can still be quite outlandish. Rolly the Sleepy Cop, his wife Patricia, the Skullkin Brothers, Drepper, Madame Tuspells, even the jury can be unique characters in and of themselves. Now, obviously, this sort of thing is highly subjective. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of people telling me that they found Life is Strange 2's cast to be much more memorable. And that's fine, but please, hear me out for a second. When it comes to character-based stories, I'm of the mindset that I prefer there to be a hint of style over realism, as it helps punch up the story and makes it a lot more interesting. A pinch of style can go a long way to help make your story a lot less dull. I'm not saying it has to be as hot as Persona 5 style, but a little flair to your game never hurts and only helps. Hell, that's especially true with character design, and I get that Life is Strange 2 is going for more realistic, but the first game managed to punch it up with Chloe's blue hair, and at the very least she stood up from the rest of the cast because of it. I don't know, when I look at great Ace Attorney's character designs, I see much more appealing art style, and one that will probably stand the test of time longer than Life is Strange 2, which is a problem with more realistic art styles, as they tend to age terribly as they depend mostly on the graphical capability. I'm not saying Life is Strange 2 is a bad looking game, but in comparison to great Ace Attorney, games that are almost five years old at this point, they look great artistically to me. Back to the character section, at least in the main group, we have Ryunosuke, Susasto, Iris, and the best character of all time, Herlock. Right off the bat, you've got a much more colorful looking cast, with Ryunosuke probably being the most generic design of said cast. But considering that you're supposed to be Ryunosuke, or be in his head, I'm willing to be a bit more lenient with his design. Besides, his design works since he's supposed to be a very uptight young man. Heck, in the first trial you can see as he defends himself, he's very rigid and nervous. But you can see him coming out of his shell. Heck. 
To point something out, Ryunosuke is accused of murder at the beginning of the first game, and his friend Kazuma is opting to defend him in court. However, and this is where I make the parallel with Sean from Life is Strange 2, the court's rigged. Not only are the witnesses being strong-armed by the government to provide false testimony, yes! But it's really made apparent that Ryonosuke is supposed to take the fall in order to make sure that the relations between Japan and Great Britain are maintained. Especially since the victim in the case was a visiting Englishman who was a professor, so you got yourself an international incident. BOOM! If you can't see why I make the comparison, both characters in these games are basically getting an unfair shake by the justice system, especially for a crime they didn't commit. But here's where I say that Ryunosuke is a much more dynamic character than Sean. Before the trial begins, another professor informs Ryunosuke that should he be found guilty while his friend Kazuma is defending him, Kazuma would be stripped of a chance of going to London. So, what does Ryunosuke do? He performs a selfless act in order to make sure that he can protect his friend's dream. Immediately, I'm more on Ryunosuke's side, and I'm enamored by him because of this. While stiff and rigid, Ryunosuke happens to be a very honorable young man. So much so, that should he fail, at least his friend would lose his dream of going to London. Yeah, it's a boneheaded move since he's unfamiliar with the court proceedings, doesn't have any experience with the legal system, and it doesn't help he's really nervous about all this. But here's the thing, I think it's a good comparison with Sean as well, because both these characters do something really really boneheaded for the sake of someone they care about. Ryunosuke putting his freedom on the line to protect his friend's dream, and Sean running away from the law in order to make sure that he and his brother don't get separated, is a good parallel if you ask me. There is a big difference, however. Ryonosuke fights back. One of the biggest issues I have with Sean was that he was just running away from his problems, and while he does become a bit more proactive in the story, his running, whether justified or not, made a very sour impression on him. But with Ryonosuke, he's willing to fight against the corruption of the courts. Ryunosuke just comes off as a much more dynamic character than Sean. They're both in similar situations where they're accused of murdering another person, they both act selflessly in order to protect someone they care about, 
and the characters are up against a system that is heavily weighed against them. There's another aspect to this, but I'll save that for another section. To me, Ryonosuke is a proactive character, and oddly enough, that can make quite a difference when it comes to likability and says a lot about a character. And it makes it all the more satisfying when we get the big objection scene. I don't know. I prefer protagonists who are actually willing to stand up for themselves in these kinds of situations, and doing it in a way that progresses them as a character, watching Ryunosuke go from a timid paper tiger and turning into a beast who's after the truth, it just really drew me to him. Heck, when interacting with other characters, Ryunosuke seems a lot more human than the realistic teenager. Since we're able to see Ryunosuke's thoughts more often, we get his reactions to the more out there characters. But even with the interaction of the characters, most notably Herlock Sholmes, we see his personality really shine during the Dance of Deduction. One of the changes that the great Ace Attorney brings to the table in gameplay is that it breaks up the investigations with these deduction sections, where you have to correct Herlock's deductions in various cases. During this gameplay, you move the camera around and search for the proper clues to help lead the path to the proper deduction. Even though at times Ryonosuke is reluctant to participate, you can see him really getting into the dance of deduction. It doesn't hurt that the presentation and music help make this a much more enjoyable means of breaking up the dialogue and searching, and it's at this point I need to bring up spoilers. Again, this time for real since we're now talking about key story events from now on. During the second chapter, Kazuma sneaks Ryunosuke onto the boat to get them to London. But during the trip, Kazuma's life is taken, and Ryunosuke is accused of killing him. Not only does Ryunosuke want to clear his name, but he wants to find the truth of what happened to his friend. In addition, when the case is over, Ryunosuke does the one thing that really made me respect the character. Taking Kazuma's sword, Ryunosuke takes Kazuma's dream as his own and follows in his friend's footsteps, becoming an attorney and spending all his time studying the law so he can fulfill his friend's ambitions. I gotta say, that's how you make a character work really well. In comparison to Sean who, while he does what he does for the sake of his brother, he's doing it in the worst way possible. He puts his brother in danger, he lies to his brother, he makes more problems for himself, and I'm sorry, but I don't feel like I should like a character like that. Ryunosuke, to me, is a better character. He's in a similar situation, he's lost someone close to him and he's willing to do what he can in order to have his departed friend's legacy live through him. There were so many other options that Sean could have taken other than going down to Mexico. He could have sought out help from his friends and co-workers. They certainly want to give him that help. I don't know, when it comes to this sort of stuff, I acknowledge that this is really highly subjective and a lot of this is up to interpretation. Save for the presentation, music, characters, and gameplay, I will say the Great Ace Attorney objectively beats Life is 2. Besides, you're essentially getting two games for the price of one. When it comes to The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, the story takes place over both games. Now, while I do have some issues with the pacing, I will say it does set up a good mystery per episode and helps keep the journey fresh throughout the playtime. This is helped by the rather lighthearted tone that the game usually has, despite the fact that most of the time you're dealing with a case that has MURDER as the crime. Well, most of the time. The journey, despite the core being surrounded by a rather bleak murder mystery and the overall story having a phantom of a very terrible crime looming overhead, it has a lighthearted tone. This is helped by the colorful characters, the personalities, the beautiful background art, and of course, the music choice works really well. Then again, it's Ace Attorney, they've typically managed to do that pretty well. Hip hop pirates that have the ability to transform to a versions of themselves notwithstanding. Yo! What the hell was that?
It also manages to cover a very interesting theme of racism, and it does so in a way that's a bit more nuanced than I like to think than Life is Strange 2. Let's not tiptoe around the issue. Ryunosuke deals with racism in the games. Even in the first trial, the real culprit blatantly flaunts that she's better than the Japanese people and knows that she can get away with murder in their country. She even calls their language dirty. And isn't the only example. There are much more subtle forms of racist behavior from the English characters, such as claiming the only reason why the jury could be changing their guilty votes to not guilty is because, and I'm not kidding, Ryanosuke is an Eastern sorcerer using his black magic on the jury. And the jurist calls him a dark jinx. <laughs> there is a lot of this sort of talk and racist commentary from various British people and how there seems to be a superiority complex to the Japanese. But here's the thing that Ryunosuke does that makes this message a lot stronger. Sure, he'll offer a thought about the comments, but he doesn't let those kinds of racist comments get to him. He has a job to do, in order to do it, he powers through it. Not to mention, his actions and words speak louder than some petty racist comments, as Ryunosuke shows what he can do, solving cases and getting not guilty verdicts in otherwise impossible cases. And he's not alone. Through the courage of his convictions, Ryunosuke proves time and time again that he's able to overcome the obstacles in front of him. And here's the thing, he's not afraid of making an enemy of the entire British Empire in order to protect his clients. Is this less realistic? Oh, well, of course. But as I already stated, realism does not equate to good. I'd rather have a much more stylish and fantastical world showing good morals can stand up to the face of corruption and abuse and racism than follow a boring story that can end with the characters essentially getting away with multiple crimes all the while making it seem like nothing they do is wrong. That the ends justify the means, and that's something I don't care for. I'd rather take a story of an honorable young man fighting against corrupt individuals 
individuals in courtroom battles to save innocents to uphold the ideals of those he lost. I'd rather enjoy the kick-ass music and character design than the bland design choices of Life is Strange 2. Hell, I'll even say that the topic of racism is covered better in this game, and I've already demonstrated that Ryonosuke deals with it, but the racism theme also takes a nuanced look by looking through the eyes of someone who might be considered racist or, how as I like to think of it, more xenophobic than anything else. Here's the thing, no one is born a bad person. No one is born racist. No one is born into this world entirely good or entirely evil. This is a belief that I hold true even to this day. And as much as the internet would like you to believe, I believe in redemption and allowing people to grow from their mistakes. So long as the line isn't crossed, of course. And that's where we reach our racist character. Barack Van Zykes. The lead prosecutor in both games, and also a character that people seem to really be divided upon. It's no secret why. On the one hand, the guy can be xenophobic, referring to Ryonosuke and Susato as Nipponese, and constantly berating the two, even going off stereotypes such as them being overly imaginative. And on the other hand... The guy's friggin' hot, okay? I'm gonna be up front about that. As if my sexuality hasn't been questioned already in the last year. Now to point this out, I am in no way saying what Van Zyke says is good. Hell, the game itself goes out of its way to point out this sort of thing isn't good, and I am in no way defending racism or xenophobia. Being racist is bad. No shit! I can't believe I had to say this. This isn't a defense for his actions, and the game doesn't paint this out to be a good thing. If anything, it shows that it's terrible. What it does show is Van Zyke's reasoning for his attitude. Again, this isn't an excuse for his racist comments, but here's the thing that people tend to forget. Historical context, and we need to take a look at this maturely. I know it's a tough order for most people on the internet who love to write essays on Reddit or Twitter and act like they can never be wrong about anything. And to those people, I have to say, enjoy the real world, boys and girls. Welcome to this thing called life. These sentiments were common in society at the time Ace Attorney takes place. But what Van Zykes and others said and did against Naruhodo and Susato and other Japanese people, like a certain culprit slash victim of said certain reporter, and other non-white ethnic groups were as wrong then as they are wrong today in the 21st century. And here's the thing, Van Zykes admits in the game that he's wrong about this behavior. There's a good reason why I'll go into later, but I need to establish this because I've been on the net for a long time and I know that people are going to argue about. I also know people are going to take this out of context. It is fine if you don't like him as a character for his behavior, his actions, or what he's said. That's perfectly fine. I understand that some people are more uncomfortable with this. But you do need to admit that he himself acknowledges his behavior is bad and even apologizes and changes his ways at the end of the games. And I still people who know this and say it isn't good enough. This happens in the real world too, where someone does or says something bad and then they grow up, realize they were shitty, apologize, try to change their ways, but people continue to treat them like they're the same jerk they used to be. What do you want from Van Zykes and these real people? Admit they were wrong and stopping the bad behavior wasn't enough for you? What should Van Zykes do instead? Keep being unapologetically racist so you can be mad at a fictional character? Should he have died? That's not interesting, rewarding, or good character writing. We should want people with bad behaviors to change. We should want them to see the errors of their ways and grow as characters. Here's the thing. What motivation is there for anyone, fictional or real, to strive to be better if they're not given the chance to actually grow as people and learn from their actions? Especially if their previous actions were caused by a form of deceit. Great Ace Attorney Chronicles actually takes a risk and attempts to explore the concept of racism and explores why someone can have a bias against a group of people.
And here's the thing, Ryunosuke actually asks Van Zykes why he has so much animosity towards him. And we learn that a Japanese person whom he was friends with, someone he looked up to, and someone who even saved his life, killed his brother. And not just his brother, but several other people as well. When the trial reached its conclusion earlier, I thought to myself, yes, it's time. Time for you to come face to face with this hideous monster. I borrowed the key for the mask from the proprietress of the Waxwork Museum. So see for yourselves now. Confirm it with your own eyes, the truth that's been hidden this past decade. Yes, that's him. Until now, a thought never even crossed my mind. That the mass murderer, whose crimes shook Britain as never before, was Japanese. Barack Van Zykes had once placed all his trust in a Japanese man only to be betrayed by him. It goes without saying that the more you trust someone, the more it hurts when said person betrays you. Even more so if said person kills someone that you are very close to. In Van Zyke's case, he was so devastated that it drove him away from the courts for five years and instilled in him distrust of an entire group of people. Again, spoiler, since this was revealed in the late game, as it turns out, it wasn't the Japanese friend who committed the murders. And in fact, he was nothing more than a pawn for a higher level of government, and the moment that Barack learns of this, he apologized to Ryanosuke for his terrible behavior. Now, I've seen that Van Zyke's has gotten a lot of hate for being racist in general. Even in the official translation, the use of Nipponese is meant to be condescending sending and pointedly racist in context. But people are also missing that being racist against the Japanese is meant to be a major point with Van Zyke's character and a stumbling block on Ryunosuke's journey to becoming a true lawyer. People are upset that a racist character is included in the game at all without taking into account any potential story or character reasons behind why the writers chose to include a racist character, in this case the antagonist, in the first place. The Japanese writers, mind you. And here's the thing, Barack respected his Japanese friend, and frankly I find it really misrepresenting to say his friend did terrible things and leave it at that. People deal or don't deal with trauma and grief in different ways, not all of them healthy. Van Zykes is an example of a person who handled it in an unhealthy way, he even admits it's illogical, but gets over it as the game progresses and is upfront with how he was wrong. The fact that he lives in Victorian England that already had that and barely knows any Japanese people before Ryunosuke and Susato makes it easier to view the Japanese as a faceless monolith that he can direct his anger towards because the logical target of his anger that he hasn't got over is dead. Again, to point out, Van Zykes at one point acknowledges he's being illogical with his actions, his words, and his behavior. So it's not like the game depicts his viewpoint as a valid way to handle those emotions. He's actively fighting against his preconceived notions and illogical thinking, but his emotions and trauma still haunt him. He admits he was wrong to hold such a deep loathing, and by extension, to give that loathing a voice. Throughout the games, Van Zykes is actually shown to be quite honorable. He's a man of logic. To cling to something which he refers to as illogical is about as wrong as one could get. He also admits this was an unstoppable force that he could have controlled, but he was just too weak to do so. The hatred of what happened to his brother overpowered him, 
and did away with his common sense. He behaved stupidly and irrationally because for 10 years, that's all he really knew. And here's the other thing that people need to consider. Van Zyke spoiled the Japanese man's actions down to his race in order to avoid the belief that there might have been a reason for his brother was killed, since the previous victims who were murdered were all corrupt members of the aristocracy of the England. A man whom was practically his only family and someone he greatly respected to the point where he wanted to follow his footsteps in becoming a lawyer. We see it a few times in the game, Van Zykes is in doubt. He may say vocally, it makes no sense, but that line in and of itself is telling of a fact. He acknowledges that it's illogical, and it also points out he's skeptical about the situation. He knows something is wrong about the story. He knows there's something he's missing, but he's afraid. He's afraid that if he dug too deeply, he'd have to acknowledge that perhaps his brother was corrupt. And funnily enough, he was right. Personally, I find it a compelling part of his character that a person who is so rational in certain aspects is extremely emotional and irrational when it comes to processing his grief. And it's not like it's a heel turn change either, it's a slow burn for Van Zyck to throw away his illogical hatred as he kept on interacting with Ryunosuke. And before you say this sort of thing is impossible, I hate to tell you, but this sort of thing has actually happened in our real world. Sitting down and talking, not necessarily agreeing, but respecting each other to air their points of view. Because of that respect and my willingness to listen and his willingness to listen to me, he ended up leaving the clan and there's his robe right there. I am a musician, not a psychologist or sociologist. If I can do that, anybody in here can do that. Take the time to sit down and talk with your adversaries. You will learn something and they will learn something from you. When two enemies are talking, they're not fighting, they're talking. It's when the talking ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So keep the conversation going. Thank you all very much. Now, to make it clear, this isn't a surefire thing. Nowadays, most people are too hard-headed with their own opinions and frankly don't want to understand other people. But you want to know what the real kicker is? Ryanosuke says this. Reminder that this game was made by Japanese people and that Ryanosuke was the most prominent target for Van Zyke's racist remarks. Really speaks a lot of our main hero who's willing to at least understand where a terrible person is coming from, to learn from him, and to possibly help him. Also, to point out, Ryonosuke doesn't take this crap all the time either. Calling people out on their bullshit is a very useful step for them to notice their mistakes. However, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that's a very Western viewpoint. It's easy for someone like me who's born and raised in America to think that Ryonosuke should stand up to himself and call Van Zyke's prejudice a little tosser who needs to think before he speaks. But here's the thing, that's not a part of Ryonosuke's character, nor is it a part of what he was grown up with. Ryonosuke is written to be your everyday Japanese person, and their view on confrontation in Japan is quite different from our own. You see, Unlike what people like to think, Japanese people are non-confrontational. It's very important for them to maintain a sort of peace during conversations, so rarely would you actually hear them utter negative sentiments. Unlike in Western societies, the group is seen as more important than the individual. If you step out of line on any aspect, it has a strong impact on the way other people see you. Your basic character and values are at stake if they judge you negatively. This is reflected very clearly in the Japanese language itself, which has both a formal and a casual form, and which makes learning Japanese very difficult for outsiders. You know how you actually see like interviews of video game developers from Japan and they'll be extremely polite, but you know deep down they really don't care for something? It's to avoid embarrassment of other people, especially if they're addressing another person. Now, you can say Van Zyke's arc ain't great, but it still opens up another view with his xenophobia. And at the very least, it does show that racism can stem from different resources, other than just blind hatred. It also shows that people can actually change over time and realize, hey, I was an idiot, let me make this up to you. I'd even say that Van Sykes is more xenophobic than racist, since his insanely rude comments don't come from a place of superiority, but rather from a place of trauma and bad experiences that he's had. Because while people can both be xenophobic and racist, fun fact, these are not interchangeable terms. Sometimes people think that xenophobia and racism are similar and their usage can be interchanged. However, this is not the case as the two words are very different. Xenophobia refers to the dislike or fearing unknown or something that is different from you. Racism, on the other hand, relates to race, determines the traits of a human, and their capacity for making them more superior than any other race. 
Now, you can be racist and xenophobic at the same time, but Barack's actions don't come from a place of superiority because of race, since he doesn't trust anyone, even other British people. Heck, I'd say he's xenophobic because of the fact his trust was broken by someone he trusted for six years of his life. The latest victim was his brother, and the Japanese man, who did it, confessed to the killings. At least that's the story he was told. You can even tell this because none of his attacks were based on what the person looks like, but rather their character. And to be frank, Ryanosuke did leave a terrible first impression by defending an obviously guilty person who was willing to falsify evidence even in the middle of a courtroom trial! At least Van Zykes also has other honorable traits. He doesn't lie, he doesn't use underhanded tactics in trials, and he's even willing to work with Ryunosuke and give trust to Ryunosuke when he's accused of murder. Hell, there's one point in the second game where he tells one of Ryunosuke's clients that he should put his faith into his lawyer, aka Ryunosuke. And yet, people will ignore all this. You can disagree, but at the very least, the game is attempting to tackle the subject in a more nuanced manner than RACISTS BE ALL BAD AND THEY NEVER CHANGE! Let's take a moment and talk about another prosecutor. Miles Edgeworth. And you wanna know something? He is actually worse than Barack! <laughs> No joke, before Miles' redemption, he was terrible! Think about it. Miles Edgeworth, for years, prosecuted people who were found guilty. It's all but confirmed that he used illegal means to win. We see his dirty tactics firsthand, such as manipulating the witnesses. Sure, the updated autopsy report as a meme, but what if that was real forgery like Phoenix suspected? Even when Phoenix Wright was accused of murdering his mentor, Edgeworth's mindset was, better to condemn 100 innocent people than let one criminal go free. He would do his best to find his old friend guilty. There's also that lovely moment when he threatened to reveal to the court the disorder of a mentally ill, possibly suicidal woman even stating, if you kill yourself, that's no concern of mine. This happened after his heel turn, by the way. But you wanna know why Miles Edgeworth is such a beloved character? Because he's hot. Because he redeemed himself. We can forgive a corrupt prosecutor for ruining innocent lives due to his trauma because he realized it wasn't right, but not being progressive enough in the 19th century England is way too cruel of a sin, even after the realization that irrationally hating people is not a good coping mechanism for having the only family you have being ripped away by someone you trusted and admired. Funny thing about that, huh? Never mind that Barack is absolutely spotless as a prosecutor compared to Edgeworth when it comes to courtroom antics. Hell, Barack hates it's perjury, and I want to make it clear, I love Miles Edgeworth. Hell, I used to cosplay as him. But it's a double standard to say it's okay for him to be able to redeem himself while Van Zykes can't. The only thing that Van Zykes is really capable of being irrationally, anagraphically not be redeemed is that he wastes so much wine and throws glasses into the courtroom gallery. Man, my voice cracked there. Van Zykes can be a scumbag. I am not arguing that. But it ignores the good parts of his character, and I find it to be very reductionistic to view not only the character himself, but Japanese culture and how tragedy can affect people in negative ways. And it's not like we don't see other forms of racism in the game. The cases with the real-life person Soseki Natsumi, who you can argue shows how harsh racism can be. Heck, part of the reason that Ryonosuke advocates Natsumi is because Natsumi can't get an attorney because he's Japanese. So, the game shows racism, not just in different forms, but also gives a real-world example since Natsumi's experience mirrors that of the actual Soseki Natsumi's experiences in the actual time in London he had. At the very least, the game makes an attempt to showcase that racism is a complicated issue with varying degrees and motivations to have it. Things are not as they seem is a key theme to the Ace Attorney games, and that also applies to the characters. Also, to point out, when the game first came out, there was a popularity poll amongst the Japanese only since because the game didn't come to the West for a few years. Van Zykes was the third most popular character! I'm not sure what this says, but hey, it's a fun little thing to think about! So see for yourselves now. Confirm it with your own eyes. The truth that's been hidden this past decade. That's... We would all be hella best friends forever. Whether you agree with me or not, at this point, I honestly don't care. 
From what I've seen with online discussions, I've seen people for both these games defend and hate on them. Some with good arguments, others being hard-headed, and frankly, it's tiring. I'm fine with people disagreeing with each other, but here's the thing. Most people don't want to admit that they're wrong. They don't want to listen to the other side. They don't care to even entertain the idea that there could be an alternative to their mindset. Hey, I'm no different. I'm only human. I'm not above being wrong. But hey, that's what the comments section is for, and I know this is going to be a headache, but there's only one thing I know for certain about these two games. That the Great Ace Attorney certainly beats Life is Strange 2 in terms of music. <laughs> HOLY HELL DAMN HORNS! Seriously, one of the things I hated with the Life is Strange series is the constant use of music in scenes with no dialogue. It's a cheap attempt to elicit an emotion from the audience. And unfortunately, I can't argue that it isn't an effective one, since, well, look at all the rewards! I love how that walkie-talkie was literally clipping through his fucking hand. He wasn't holding it. L look at that! What is that?! Look at the walkie- <laughs> It's so bad! It's so terrible! How do you take this long to make this episode and release it like this? Oh, now it's not there? Was that a glitch? Did I break the game? Oh, there it is! Oh! But if you ask me, it doesn't matter if a game has awards, especially considering the rewards most of the time are chosen by video game journalists. And frankly, I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking on how dumb that is. But regardless, if anything you can take from this video, it's not that I think Life is Strange 2 is good, nor do I think that the great Ace Attorney is bad, or vice versa. It's just that I want to be able to play and enjoy games, regardless if there is or isn't a political message in it. I don't believe that politics can inherently destroy or wreck a piece of media. That's simply fallacious thinking. No, it depends on the execution as well as whatever's surrounding the message. You could have the greatest message in the world, but I'm not going to want to listen if you keep having me do the dullest of works. A lecture could easily be teaching me the best things in the world, but if it's delivered by this guy, I'm sorry, but I ain't going to listen. Especially if it's a medium whose main goal is entertainment. Not even Don't Nod care about this game, especially since the promotional material for True Colors included the original game, but no mention of this one. Bravo, Don't Nod. And I have a big issue with games like Life is Strange 2. Games that are heralded for simply including the politics, but will immediately ignore all other issues that the game have, and not question if it makes any sense. These kinds of games take away the attention from other games I think should get the spotlight, but also get a pass for some of the dumbest crap I've seen in a long time. No joke, I've seen people call The Great Ace Attorney a Japanese game made by Japanese people racist, simply because it has racist people in it and because the game at least attempted to talk about the subject of racism and xenophobia in a different, broad manner. Meanwhile, games like Life is Strange 2 basically do the racism is bad and it's suddenly being treated as the Jesus of games! Even though it's a French game studio that's commenting on American politics and as such has as much subtlety as a baseball bat to the head. So, I guess what I'm saying is, go get the great Ace Attorney. I'm tired of Ace Attorney series being in hibernation, and we need to get more courtroom battles. We need to do it before I get arrested for even having the idea to even criticize a game like, uh, shit! Police, over there! This is the police! Come on out of the way, we'll beat you!